Yes, thank you, Moon, uh, for the introduction, and thank you for the Danish to Sanne also Sanne Hoffman from the Danish Institute for the opportunity to come and speak my, about my uh, book. Um, uh, and it's true, I'm also no stranger to this house. I've been here several times. Uh, actually, my career in uh, as a scholar began here in in this very house uh, when in 2009 I was uh, on a a monthly stay. It was in, in the old Parthenonos apartment where I wrote my PhD application, which got rejected. <laughs> then I tried once more and then I got it. And so that, uh, so, and it was a great uh, pleasure and a help to sit here uh, in Athens uh, to go to churches and even hear the texts of Romanos being sung still today. Uh, so it was, I'm, I'm thank, forever grateful to the Danish Institute in Ath at Athens to, to be able to come here and work every now and then. Yes, Songs of the Night, uh, you see the picture of the uh, cover from the book on, on the PowerPoint. And um, I'll get back to why it's called Songs of the Night. Um, um, yeah, it was... Uh, published uh, three months ago, around three months ago, um, 15th of September. If there are any uh, people who, uh, I don't know there, if there are any who uh, attend Orthodox services, but it's the very date of uh, the elevation of uh, the cross, which is a, a, a fest, fest, uh, festival service in, in, um, in the Orthodox Church. And just two weeks later, on the 1st of October, Romanos, the melodist whom I'm going to talk about, is also celebrated in the Orthodox Church. He's among, in, here in Greece and uh, in Orthodox, uh, among Orthodox Christians, he's counted as, as one of the major, if not the biggest, the greatest poet in, in, uh, in Orthodox uh, hymnography. Um, it's a book that uh, contains a short uh, a preface by a, a bishop in Denmark uh, called Eluf Vestergaard, also not a stranger of uh, Greece. Uh, and then, as Mons uh, told you, it has images, uh, and I'll get back to the distinction, images and not illustrations, by the Danish, po uh, the Danish artist Peter Brandes. Um, and as you said, he, uh, they have an apartment here and his wife here in Athens, and they just were here uh, just before Christmas. They stayed until the 5th of January, and they had to go back to Denmark. But we uh, originally, I hope that we could be here, both of us, to present uh, the book, which would have been very nice. But they had to go back to Denmark to a snowstorm <laughs> and ice, so I don't know what I would have rather preferred to be here. And then, uh, not least, uh, I've written a, a, a somewhat lengthy introduction to uh, the book, to Romanos and to his poetry, and uh, translated four hymns um, uh, and written a commentary also to each of the, the hymns in, in Danish. Um, so for those of you who have never heard about Romanos or Melodos, as I would say, you would say in Greek, uh, Romanos Melodos means uh, singer, or I would sometimes uh, say that uh, it's actually a term in Byzantine Greek that covers both someone who's a singer and someone who writes text and melody. So you could actually, with a completely anachronistic uh, term, call him a singer-songwriter, because that was, he was a Byzantine singer-songwriter. Uh, he lived around, uh, he was born in, at the end of the 5th century and lived a uh, major part of his life uh, in the 6th century in Constantinople. He was born, probably born in Syria. Uh, and we hear from a much later uh, account of his life, which is uh, a vita, so a saint, saint's life, that you have to be somewhat careful about the information you get in saint's life. They can be very uh, doubtful. Uh, but we hear that he came from Syria and he came to Constantinople too and became a singer in one of the churches in the outskirts of the city. 
and then we hear one of the we get one of the informations about his life that is perhaps a bit uh, if we are at least a modern day uh, post enlightenment uh, people uh, would say that is probably uh, a pious uh, uh, rendering of uh, his gift of composing uh, text and melody, which was that on the very night of Christmas Eve, uh, he actually fell asleep inside the church. And I, I don't know, I don't think the pastor would have uh, liked that, but he fell asleep. And then uh, in his dream, uh, and this is what is shown at this uh, picture, um, uh, the Theotokos or the uh, Virgin Mary, his, uh, uh, the mother of Christ, comes to him in his dream and gives him a scroll and, and uh, says to him, swallow this. Uh, and then he swallows it and he wakes up and then he begins chanting his most famous song uh, in Greek, Ipathenos Simaron, uh, a Christmas hymn that most Greeks would know because uh, it's so famous. And, um, and from then on, he began composing a lot of uh, hymns and the, the saints life say that, uh, says that he uh, composed more than a thousand hymns. We only have uh, around 60 uh, left uh, for, uh, for, for the future, for, um, uh, uh, after his lifetime that are uh, considered genuine. And then there's around 30 hymns that are attributed to him, but which are considered dubious or written by other authors. And he wrote hymns in a certain genre in, in the uh, Byzantine, later orthodox, hymnography called a kontakion. And the word just means a little rod or little staff that you roll a parchment around. Uh, so it's, it's, the word doesn't say anything about uh, the hymn as such. Uh, it's the same as uh, in uh, Italian, we say a libretto, which is the, um, the, the play for uh, an opera. Uh, so a libretto just means a small book in Italian. So it's the same kind of metonymical shift that the material becomes the name of the, the genre. But these contacchia he wrote were originally long hymns, um, uh, of about 18 to 22 quite lengthy stanzas. Then in, um, in uh, the process of unifying and uh, probably also shortening uh, down the Orthodox liturgy and especially the uh, offices of uh, the monastic offices, the Contakia got shortened to only uh, the first stanza, which is a sort of a proem or prelude, and then uh, one more stanza. And this is how it is today. So for many, many years until Romanos was sort of rediscovered in the uh, second part of the 19th century, uh, in the Orthodox services, you would only know uh, him from, from a lot of hymns that are scattered around the, uh, uh, the liturgical year, but only from two with two stanzas from from each hymn. Uh, so he was known in a very abbreviated version. Uh, and um, normally these hymns would have an introductory stanza, which is short and, and introduces the theme, uh, which is called uh, a kukulion uh, uh, or a proem in proemion. Uh, and then it would be followed by these 18 to 22 longer stanzas, which are called in with the Rashmian pronunciation oikoi or iki in, in, uh, in, um, in Byzantine Greek, modern Greek. Uh, and these are uh, confusingly, the, the proem is today, if you take an Orthodox, Orthodox service book, uh, the proem is called a kontakion. And then the following stanza is called an, an oikoi or iki. So it's a bit confusing. But what ties these uh, different stanzas, they have uh, different meters together, is that every stanza is followed by a refrain that is the same. And the refrain often has the same, um, uh, of, often condenses the theme of the hymn. And then one more thing that ties all the stanzas together is that if you take the first letter of each stanza, it forms a, a, a sentence of what is called an acrostic. And it often says, by the humble Romanos. So he signed his, 
hymns by uh, secretly by writing the f by having as a compositional principle that each dancer should begin with a word from this sentence uh, by the humble uh, Romanos. So this was sort of formal criteria for the contacia. Then we have more um, uh, content-wise. What what do we find in the, in the contacia? The, uh, his hymns, the contacia, are often, uh, most often, dramatic retellings of main stories in the Bible, both from the Old Testament and from the New Testament, and sometimes even from uh, the ones we call the Apocrypha, so the text that didn't become part of the Bible. Um, and he retells these stories as kind of small dramas where the biblical figures or biblical characters would engage in dialogue and they would often he would often find somewhere in in the biblical story where this where the um the um for instance in the gospel uh, as one of the, the hymns i've translated uh, there is this story about uh, the disciple peter who uh, denies that he knows uh, he knows who christ is he's asked three times do you know you were the one who followed christ Christ, they say, and he says, I don't know the man at all. I don't know him. Uh, and then what Romanos would do would be, uh, which was a kind of a rhetorical exercise also to say, what went, what went through the mind of Peter when he denied his best friend? Let's, let's uh, probe his mind, he would say. And then he would let Peter enter the stage and uh, Peter would speak uh, in sort of an inner monologue, uh, revealing his inner thoughts and feelings. Uh, but it would also sometimes be dialogues between uh, um, the mother of uh, God, uh, so the Virgin Mary, and Joseph, where Joseph, of, co of course, in, in the gospel, we don't hear much about. Um, he must have been, you know the story, that, uh, that uh, suddenly she was pregnant, <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, Joseph didn't have, have anything to do with that pregnancy, according to the, to the gospels. So in the in the in some of the hymns of Romanos, we we have a long a long dialogue with, with Joseph. Uh, is very critical. He says, "How how has this happened?" Um, uh, and asks if his wife, "How how did you become pregnant?" And then she, of course, has to uh, to tell him uh, how it all happened and how it was uh, by divine uh, intervention. So and often these um, hymns are quite amusing. Actually, they're quite. Uh, entertaining uh, to read. Um, uh, it seems that he wrote, he, he wrote them and performed them pro probably also for a very, very broad audience in the churches. So he was competing with all kinds of distractions outside in Constantinople and, uh, and had to uh, gain the attention of the congregation. And he would do that by telling amusing, uh, sometimes even comical uh, stories and sometimes even using a very vulgar uh, language. Um, he would often also try to, uh, and that's the thing that can annoy you so, so, uh, when you're reading him and translating him, that he tries to find all the possible connections between Old Testament stories and uh, New Testament stories. So if there's a person in the Old Testament called Joseph, he must point at, uh, at uh, Jesus's uh, father, uh, Joseph. And if there's a character called Judas in the Old Testament, this must be a, a a, a foreshadowing of uh, of Judas, the disciple who betrayed him. So he's trying always to find these kinds of parallels, and that's not a thing that he's um, uh, special for him. That was special for the that at that time that was the way you interpreted the Bible, and it's called a, some call it a typological reading. But one thing that's very fun when you read him in Greek is that he's very fond of word plays. Uh, and I grew up with a father who's also very fond of uh, like making father jokes, I should probably know dad jokes, which are basically st stupid word plays. Uh, and Romanos does a lot of these stupid or sometimes very brilliant uh, word plays. Um, for instance, he can say in, a, in his Christmas hymn just after the famous proem that says he parthenos simeron, he can say for instance, that, and you would, you would not be able to see that in translation, but he's, he says to the audience, um, come, let us see Bethlehem has opened the Garden uh, of Eden. And what you can see in the translation is that uh, in Greek, it's Bethlehem, that's Bethlehem, but the Garden of Eden is Edem. So there's a rhyme between Bethlehem and Edem. 
and by this way he can sort of uh, he can sort of um, 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 he can tell the whole story of uh, the salvation his story so of course the garden of eden was the fall of adam and eve and bethlehem is the place where salvation is now born uh, um, so he can um, uh, he can he can compress it very much into a very small sentence and say something very uh, profound um, and it was written in a kind of uh, popular uh, koine or kini uh, greek uh, which was uh, easy to follow for uh, the uh, congregation um, and one thing that uh, a friend of mine a colleague uh, from uh, he lives in sweden but he's norwegian thomas arnsen uh, who's also written uh, and just recently translated um, a substantial part of the hymns of Romanos. Uh, it would be out on, um, on Dombarton Oaks uh, uh, Press this year. Uh, he has spent a lot of, uh, he, he did his research especially on the Mariology of, so how, how, uh, how, how should we understand the role of the Virgin Mary or the Mother of God? Um, yeah, and, and then the, uh, concerning the title, um, Songs of the Night, um, we don't know exactly when these hymns were sung, uh, because it's still, um, uh, it's still uh, quite, um, there aren't many sources to how the liturgy were, was performed in the sixth century, that if we have only have later sources that might reflect, uh, or pro most probably reflect the later stage. But if we look at the hymns themselves, uh, in what Romanos says sometimes, he's, he, says, he says in one hymn, that now we have been gathered here for a night vigil. So most probably these songs were sung uh, Saturday, so on the night before Sunday, on the great feasts, so before Christmas, before the Epiphany, before uh, uh, Easter, uh, and uh, they were sung so between Saturday and um, and Sunday on uh, in the night, um, and um, uh, that's why I chose the title uh, "Songs of the Night" because it's uh, it's. I also wanted to find a title that worked in Danish that would uh, be uh, attractive because if I wrote. Um, um, something like uh, Byzantine hymns in Danish. I think no one would have uh, bought the book <laughs> because there was a, each time I've, I've been trying to present what when, when people ask what do you do and I say Byzantine hymnography, they it's they're two big question marks in their heads and uh, and they suddenly say oh that sounds interesting now I want to <laughs> so Romanos uh, just to put him in context uh, he um, he lived in as I said, in the sixth century in uh, the New York of that period, Constantinople, it was no exaggeration to say from around the middle of the uh, fourth century and until the yeah, late medieval period, Constantinople was the city um, to, to go to. Um, and this is, was this was a very interesting period. Rome had just fallen in the at the end of the fourth cent, uh, fifth century, and um, and uh, German tribes had taken over. The Ostrogoths had, had taken over. But when we are at this very period in the middle of the sixth century, uh, the great uh, emperor Just, Justinian actually succeeded. Uh, he had some very talented general, generals to reconquer a lot of the lost empire that had gone lost to. Uh, the Vandals and the Ostrogoths and the Visigoths. So it's actually a period where the, it, we often told that the Roman Empire fell in 476, but it didn't. It just uh, continued as the Eastern Roman Empire. Um, and they always, as they, you would read that in any uh, book on the Byzantine Empire, that uh, the, they understood themselves as Rum or as uh, Romans. Uh, all the way until the end of uh, the, the fall of Constantinople in 1453. So it was a Roman Empire. The Latin was still the uh, administ administrative language, but Greek was the everyday spoken language and also the language of the church at this time in the Eastern Roman uh, Empire. Um, it was also the time where uh, the um, uh, Church of uh, Holy Wisdom, uh, the Hagia Sophia, was um, 
destroyed during a revolt that was in 532, the Nika revolt, revolt in January 532. Uh, there were some um, circus factions, like uh, it's almost like, uh, you know, uh, football supporters, uh, soccer supporting teams. Today, they were uh, um, very uh, upset with, uh, with the emperor. I think it was because of uh, a tax policy they, they didn't like. So they, they, they uh, started a revolt in January 532 that ended up destroying a lot of the old uh, Constantinople. And then Justinian uh, made his, his ambition to uh, uh, restore a lot of, uh, rebuild a lot of the things that were uh, uh, destroyed. And uh, in five years, uh, by help of some, some of the, the best architects and engineers at that time, he erected the uh, Hagia Sophia that we can see now in more or less the same uh, shape in, in Istanbul to, today. Um, this is also mentioned in one of the hymns of Romanos, and this is the reason why we can be quite certain that he's from, from this, uh, from this uh, time period. Um, yeah. And just to give you um, uh, an overview, this is this is the empire at the time of uh, the end of uh, Justinian's uh, uh, the, the year Justinian dies in 565. So you can see it's almost almost the same as the Roman Empire in its its heyday in in the uh, first and second centuries AD. Um, yeah, and I just have some some pictures from uh, uh, the very famous picture of. Uh, um, Justinian, one of the uh, still extant mosaics from the early Byzantine period, from uh, but from the Western hemispheres, or from the Western, um, not hemisphere, but the Western uh, part of the empire, uh, because um, 200 years later, there was this iconoclastic crisis where all the images were destroyed. So the ones that were left were in the Western part where, where they didn't uh, support uh, this iconoclasm. And this shows uh, Justinian and his uh, uh, wife, uh, Theodora, on the, on the other uh, mosaic, uh, dedicating uh, or uh, uh, erecting this uh, uh, church, San Vital, in, in Ravenna. Um, and then as the last picture, I have uh, um, or modern picture of uh, Aya Sof uh, Sophia uh, in, in Istanbul. And I won't mention what has happened to it in the last couple of years. We'll pass over that quickly. <laughs> um, so uh, the question is then why a Danish translation of the hymns of uh, Romanos? Well, one of the reasons is uh, that he, uh, among a lot of uh, um, um, classical uh, scholars and Byzantine scholars is reckoned as one of the greatest poets of uh, the Greek language after antiquity. Some would even say that he's uh, he's on the level of uh, of um, Homer and uh, and Pindar. Uh, but also, uh, as you might know, uh, those of you from Greece, that uh, um, uh, Odysseus Elitis. Uh, when he received the Nobel Prize in, liter uh, uh, in literature, he also mentioned Romanos as one of his big influences in his poetry. And the same thing goes with Swedish po poetry from uh, the uh, 20th century, uh, especially Jalma Gulberg and uh, Gunnar Ekelöf. Uh, they were very, very uh, inspired by Byzantine poetry and Romanos in particular. Uh, so there is a kind of, um, and it's interesting that uh, Jalma Gulber, who uh, uh, translated the Christmas hymn of um, Romanos uh, in 1942, so during the Second World War, uh, he got the material for his translation uh, from a Danish uh, classical philologist, Carsten Hu, who was one of the uh, polyhistors of, of Danish uh, uh, science. So actually it was, uh, in, this, in Scandinavia, the whole um, the whole um, uh, um, um, that people discovered uh, Romanos was actually thanks to Danish uh, uh, this Danish uh, philologist who was also uh, one of the founding fathers of um, of uh, um, of um, uh, a committee uh, that uh, 
uh, was founded in the beginning of the 1930s that began creating a system for transcribing the old medieval Byzantine chant, uh, what's called Monumenta Musicae Byzantine, um, which is still, and um, we'll see how long it, it, uh, it, uh, it would be there, but it's still located at uh, Copenhagen University. Yeah, so, um, so he's, and, and as I told you in the beginning, also in the Orthodox, among Orthodox Christians, they would also uh, count Romanos as one of the, if you go to the Kapnikarea church, as I did today, uh, there's actually just on the right side on, uh, of the altar, there is a, a, an image showing um, uh, the two great poets uh, of the Orthodox uh, hymnograph, uh, Hymnology. Uh, one is uh, Joseph the hymnographer, and the other one is Romanos the melodist. Uh, but this is a modern, more modern painting. It's, it's been decorated in, in the 20th century. But uh, Kapnikarea is the one who's uh, the one that's at uh, Armu in the middle of the streets. So suddenly, uh, I think. Yeah. Um, but uh, the reason was also that uh, I have a friend who established uh, a publishing house and. Um, and uh, he asked me, so do you have anything in your drawers you would like to publish? <laughs> and I said, yeah, why not? Uh, and uh, and then, um, then we ended up uh, uh, finding, uh, yeah, it, it would be a good idea to perhaps let's do a, a, a little book, like a test book. And then I could also find out if, if I could, if I at all was competent at translating. Uh, I had only been translating for scholarly work, so in a more dry manner, I would say. Um, and then I thought, uh, if I asked uh, uh, Iluf Vestergaard, whom I also know, uh, uh, and we share an interest in, um, in, in Byzantine poetry uh, and Byzantium in general, uh, if he could write a preface, it would perhaps uh, give me a sort of, uh, it, it would be a validation of, uh, of what I was uh, trying to, uh, if, he, if he could say yes to it. And he said yes, and then he suggested me that I contacted uh, Peter Brandes, um, they are good friends also, the two of them. And he said, uh, if you ask Peter, he, uh, I'm sure he, he would like to uh, contribute because he also has, he has also read Romanos. And I thought, okay, two people, I thought I was the only one who really knew anything about Romanos, but, but uh, Elof, I knew he had read him, but it was interesting with Peter Brandes also. And then I, I called him and he said, yes, of course, he would like to do that. And, uh, and he told me about his, uh, that he is almost, uh, the first time he encountered Romanos was this um, um, Swedish translation of Romanos from, uh, from 1942 by Jan Mark And, and uh, he had just in 2020 published a new version of this Swedish poem. Uh, or new, the, the poem is the same, or the, 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 the translation is the same, but he had uh, uh, also, uh, done a wonderful uh, artwork of a book. It, the book is an artwork in, in itself and, and put in illustrations or you know, images, pictures. Um, and uh, so he was, uh, he was, he had Romanos on his mind when I contacted him. And in the beginning, it was only supposed to be like a front page and then a, a picture for each hymn. But he ended up making uh, 21 pictures in total, total for the whole book. And he also, um, and that was a, a huge uh, economical relief for the publish, publisher that he suggested that he could do all the layout for the book also. Uh, because he's actually, um, besides being an artist, he's also recognized as a as uh, someone uh, who's won prizes for uh, book handwork. So the, the, the whole handwork thing of, of creating the books. And then, of course, the, 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 the most obvious reason is that there is no book on Romanos in Danish, uh, or there was no book on Romanos in Danish. And there are no books in general in, general in, in Danish on Byzantine literature. It's, it's uh, uh, we have to go to Sweden to find a book that introduces people to uh, Byzantine literature. So this was the reason why, and then I'll just pr shortly present. So this is uh, Elof Vestergaard, who's the bishop of uh, the Diocese of Riebe. Um, if you compare um, Danish uh, uh, 
the Danish uh, bishops and, and pastors with the uh, Greek uh, pastors, it's quite different, I would say. Uh, you wouldn't recognize that he was, uh, if you saw him on the street, that he is a bishop. Um, but uh, Eluf is also a scholar, on, uh, and he, um, uh, he, he is very interested in Byzantium, and he traveled around with his wife many years ago, around, uh, all, they, they, they took their bicycles and uh, went on a trip here in, in Greece, and also, he stayed in uh, in, um, in Istanbul uh, several uh, times, and has written uh, extensively on the Kora uh, Khora Church uh, in Istanbul, on, on the image program uh, of this uh, church. Uh, and uh, um, he also says that uh, Romanos is one of his biggest inspirations as a pastor. Uh, he takes very much inspiration from from him. And then uh, uh, Peter Brandes, and uh, I just saw here in the house, I didn't know it, but uh, he's also, there are also uh, uh, um, watercolors uh, paintings from him around here in, in the house. Um, he is a, a very highly uh, internationally recognized artist who has uh, uh, done exhibitions uh, all around the uh, planet. Um, he um, works in many different uh, materials. So he also does a lot of uh, uh, bronze uh, sculptures, but also uh, uh, ceramics. And uh, But he, perhaps most uh, known for his uh, work, as Mons told us, uh, uh, of uh, making uh, images for, um, for instance, Homer's Odyssey and the Iliad and uh, Virgil and Ovid and most recently also. Uh, we had in Denmark, that's uh, quite interesting, uh, we had uh, three translations of Sappho uh, coming out uh, around the same, like 2020-21. Uh, so there was an interest in Sappho at that, uh, at that time, and uh, he illustrated uh, one of them. And then uh, the picture here you see is uh, from, it's quite recently, uh, uh, around a, a year ago in uh, Easter 2023, uh, this new chapel was um, opened in the, cathedral, in the cathedral of Aarhus in Denmark, which he has completely renovated and, and decorated. Um, uh, and it's very, it's actually, I think it's Lazarus, you can see who's uh, flying in the air. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, so I was very happy that he would be on, on board of this uh, uh, trans translation uh, book. So which uh, hymns have I translated? I translated one which um, is uh, in the Orthodox Byzantine tradition is just called Another Christmas Hymn. That's, the, that's kind of the title. That doesn't say much, but um, my, um, my good friend and colleague uh, Thomas Arnsen came up with the title Christmas in Hades because this is really what it's you you hear the gospel uh, story of uh, the birth of christ from an unexpected uh, uh, place or angle uh, it, it's a hymn that begins with mary singing a lullaby to uh, her baby uh, savior baby god <laughs> uh, and this sound travels uh, through uh, the earth down to hades where adam and eve are sleeping and uh, Eve uh, immediately hears this lullaby and recognizes, oh, this is uh, the new spring. This is, uh, this is uh, salvation for us. It's coming now. And then, and it's quite uh, comical because then she tries to wake up Adam, who's uh, sleeping. And he says, I don't want to listen to women. I've tried that before. It didn't work. Um, it, yeah. <laughs> And then, um, then, and and what is funny also? Then, then she says, uh, "But, uh, but listen, listen. Uh, you, your ears are blocked uh, with uh, by obedience, disobedience." And then, um, then what convinces him is not what he hears, but that he suddenly feels a fresh smell of uh, air and says, "Well, this uh, this fresh air is the same air that got." Uh, blown in my nostrils just after I was formed by dirt and clay by God in the Garden of Eden. So he recognizes that it is the same air that's, that's, um, that's now uh, also telling about uh, salvation. And then what redeems his, his, uh, his, um, his uh, nasty comment to, to Eve is that, um, that uh, Adam and Eve then go up uh, and, and uh, speak with um, 
marry. And then we have a, 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 a fun complaint by um, Eve who's saying, please, can you make this happen? Uh, can, you, can you go to Christ and tell us that we want to be liberated? Because I'm stuck with this Adam. He's complaining all the time. He's really annoying, uh, which is also like, quite funny. Uh, and then in the, so this is the first part of the hymn, and then the second part of the hymn is Mary speaking with her, her child soul. Uh, this baby can speak already, <laughs> but we find that in a lot of, um, of, of, of uh, the um, so-called apocryphal gospels from the, this period also. Um, and then it becomes much more serious, and it's about uh, Christ trying to uh, tell his mother that uh, she she's, she's happy now, but she will in a while, she will see him hanging on, on the cross and being stabbed by a sword and a lance and so on. So she, she should be aware that this is not, uh, that at some point he will disappear, but it's only to save Adam and Eve. That's the real reason. Uh, so it's pointing also at the resurrection and Easter. Then I translated the longest of uh, Romanos's hymns, uh, which is uh, on the Patriarch uh, Joseph uh, in the Old Testament, uh, the one who uh, um, is uh, um, betrayed or, or uh, his brothers are very envious, so they throw him in a cistern and then he's sold as a slave to the Egyptians and uh, in time he becomes actually the uh, second hand or the prime minister of the Pharaoh, Pharaoh in, in Egypt uh, and then he's reunited with reunited with his brothers who can't recognize that it's actually Joseph. Um, and what's interesting in this hymn is that Romanos actually all the time sort of just uh, does small um, gestures or allusions uh, pointing at the, the Byzantine emperor because he says that Joseph is not in, in the in the Old Testament we hear that he's wearing a multicolored uh, uh, robe um, but in, in the hymn of Romanos, he's wearing a purple robe, which was the prerogative of, of Byzantine emperors, that they were the only ones who were allowed to wear the purple. And then also, it's quite funny also that when he's thrown into the cistern by his brothers, he says, oh, the, is, this new my, is this my new royal palace? Uh, so, so, so Romanos is clearly sort of using Joseph as a kind of uh, Fürstenspiegel where he, he's, he's trying to use uh, Joseph as the, the ideal uh, emperor. Uh, and this uh, hymn is full of dramatic irony because, he, um, because the brothers cannot recognize him. So they are constantly saying things that, uh, oh, this uh, nice, uh, this nice uh, prime, prime minister in, uh, in Egypt, he's like a brother for us. Uh, and they don't know that he's actually their brother. So he's playing with this uh, uh, dramatic irony all the time. Then the third one is, is the one I mentioned on Peter, where we, we, um, we hear about his thoughts on, on betraying his best friend. And then the uh, final one is, is my favorite, which is called the Triumph of the Cross, which um, Romanos, uh, one fourth of his hymns are on Easter, uh, uh, themes related to Easter, so from uh, Palm Sunday onto uh, Easter uh, Sunday. And uh, he wrote, um, six hymns alone on the resurrection or the anastasis in greek and uh, this is also a hymn that picks up a, a theme that was uh, a very um, um it was around as a, as a as a, a narrative at this time where we hear about the consequences of the crucifixion and the resurrection from uh, hades from below the ground uh, and this is also a kind of a, com a comical hymn where um, uh, Hades, who's personified, and the devil are discussing the consequences. And it, the hymn begins with, um, with uh, Hades being uh, really frightened, and he knows that something has happened that will, uh, will uh, completely take all his powers. His main powers were, was that he was... Uh, Hades was the one who swallowed all the dead souls when they die. He was like a, a big monster who swallows the souls of the dead. And he can feel an urge to throw up. <laughs> so he says, I, something has happened and I'm, I, I'm about to throw up. 
and I think I'll throw up all the dead souls I have in my belly. Um, and then uh, the devil says, no, 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 nothing is wrong. If it's that stupid man, Jesus, I, it was me who, who, um, uh, who, who, who told the Jews that they should uh, uh, put him on a cross. So we don't, because he has set Lazarus free, but now we'll make sure that he sets no one free anymore. So, um, so the devil is, uh, he doesn't realize, uh, he doesn't really uh, realize what's going on until the mid of the hymn where he suddenly realizes that, uh, oh shit, <laughs> uh, oh darn, it's, uh, yeah, it's over with us. Um, so, so, uh, so, and I remember reading this uh, when I began studying Romanos and thinking, uh, this is, uh, this is, uh, how can, this was performed in a Christian context and it's so, it's like a comedy, really. Um, and that was also one of the things that was, uh, has been discussed in the Romanos re uh, research was whether or not these hymns that have a strong dramatic, perhaps even a theatrical potential, were performed as a kind of theater inside the church. And um, uh, the main, uh, or the main sort of um, um, consensus is that no, they were not performed as theater because at this very moment in uh, Byzantium and also later, there was a strong, very strong anti-theatrical stance from the church. Um, and it's also the time period during Justinian where the ancient theater simply stops because he stops funding uh, theatrical activities. So it would have been highly unlikely that uh, they would uh, perform something as theater inside the church, but still it's kind of, um, I would call them dramatic monologues that were sung by this, uh, uh, by Romanos, where he would perhaps even sort of imitate some or play some of the roles as, as, as the biblical uh, characters. Yeah, and then um, um, what was the aim and ambition with the tr translation? I aimed it at a very broad group of readers um, who are not necessarily very familiar with the Bible, but I have pres been presenting it for a very broad uh, uh, audience who are not very familiar with the Bible. And it, I must say that it's a, it's a pedagogical um, uh, challenge. <laughs> when, the, when people are not very familiar with the Bible stories. So, uh, but I wanted him really to become a, a, a more than just uh, something for the Danish uh, church uh, to, to, to um, um, enjoy. Uh, I also wanted, the, like there were some uh, translations around in Danish already, um, like around 10 translations or so, but they were kind of already antiquarian uh, when they came out. They were written in a language that was supposed to be very elevated and, and sound like the Bible. And I wondered, when I read Romanos in Greek, I think he's very, as I said, he can be very ser serious, he can be very elevated, but he can also be very entertaining and he can be comical and he can even be uh, vulgar to, to such a degree that you, uh, he doesn't leave uh, anything to, uh, uh, behind of uh, Homer, like you know, when Homer can Homer can sometimes really be fond of uh, telling how someone's brain is mashed uh, when when a spear is uh, is going through the skull. That's something that Homer re Homer likes to tell how people die die awful deaths, and uh, Romanos can also do this kind of uh, uh, very sort of too modern taste, very vulgar way of uh, a very lively way of describing something very um, uh, unpleasant. Um, so, and the hymns were, um, uh, they have these meters in Greek and uh, I decided very early on that I wouldn't want to try to sort of adapt them to the Greek meters because it's, it's simply too, um, if you compare them with, for instance, Homer's uh, meters, which are hexameters, uh, there's a tradition for writing in hexameters in Danish and, you can, and it's a very stable rhythm so you can actually make it work in Danish. Whereas Romanosis, you can't even, it's, it's actually wrong to call them meters, but it's more like rhythmical patterns where the stress is always the same uh, in the stanzas, but you can't really predict. It's not like ba-bum, 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 ba-bum. Uh, it's, 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 uh, it, the, the, the stress is, you, you can't operate with metrical feet, so that makes a translation very uh, difficult. And then I also wanted to emphasize the narrative quality of uh, 
Afromanos's uh, hymn. So, so it's I, I, it's more like um, uh, um, uh, non-metric prose, I would say. Uh, and then the last thing is that when I when I quote from uh, well, when there are quotes uh, or allusions to the Bible, when they are clearly intended to be something that you, sh as an audience or reader, should be able to recognize, and say, oh, that's from that's from uh, from the Old Testament, then I try to I've tried to use a wording that's very close to the most recent Danish translation of the Bible. But whenever there are allusions that are less sort of foregrounded, I want to be closer to the language of Romanos because uh, sometimes the Greek uh, translation of the Old Testament deviates a lot from the Hebrew uh, translation of, uh, or Hebrew version of, and then I kept uh, Romanos' um, um, wording. And then the last thing I uh, would long, like to say something about is, is the um, uh, cooperation with, uh, with Peter Brandes. Um, and I'll show some examples of his, uh, his uh, images. Uh, the reason why I say images is that uh, he said from the start, I don't want to uh, write, I don't want to make a comic book. I don't want to illustrate, I don't want to go and uh, take a stanza and paint what I see in the stanza. I want to read Romanos, but I also want to contribute with my own artwork, which is uh, uh, which is um, uh, which is very much uh, has inspiration from the whole Christian artwork tradition, but also also has a lot of his own uh, flavors. And he actually did the same with the with Homer's Odyssey and and the Iliad. Uh, uh, and Sappho. So it's not like, uh, for instance, the famous Gustave Doré's uh, um, illustrated Bible, for instance. For instance, it's separate artworks that could have been published anywhere else, basically. Uh, and some of them uh, were created directly um, to this book, and some of them were uh, some he had been some had even been lying around here in Greece in their apartment here in Greece for several years. And he said, but this one, it's, it's, it's a good, it's an, it's a good way to go in dialogue with the, with the, with the text. Uh, so that was, and I said, yeah, I, I completely agree that we should, it shouldn't be like a, a cartoon. It should be a, a comic book. It should be like artworks that, uh, um, that, that go into dialogue. And, and then he chose uh, also to work with uh, different materials and uh, techniques. Uh, watercolor is one of them. Um, and this is, um, so I didn't know that before we presented the book and he told us about the reasons for choosing techniques, but watercolor he, he sort of chose because it's about uh, the birth of Christ and it's actually the, the sort of, um, yeah, what, is, what is the word for the wa water you have in your uh, womb? <laughs> uh, I can't remember the name, I don't know the name. In a, a biotic lit, lit, amniotic. amniotic, yeah. Uh, so he wanted water to, to sort of be that uh, connection. Then he uses charcoal when he um, illustrates the hymn on. So this is the first hymn that I call Christmas in Hades. Uh, then charcoal is used when he uh, illustrates. Um, or yeah, now I say illustrate, but when he uh, has made images for the the hymn on uh, Joseph. Uh, because he wanted a more black white um, um, and, and sort of the, he says that uh, the Old Testament is, is a, sh is, is a fore foreshadowing the New Testament. So he, that he wanted this kind of uh, um, uh, black and white. Um. And then uh, uh, he also used oil chalk uh, for the hymn on, on Peter. Um, and finally woodcut uh, on this uh, on the victory of the cross because it's through the hymn, the material itself, uh, wood, uh, is, uh, is, is, is emphasized in the hymn. So that was his connection. So th this is the way he, he works. And then, um, so I didn't put uh, the images in the right uh, order, but uh, here you see uh, uh, an image from the last one. This is a woodcut uh, that shows uh, the foot of Christ and the skull of Adam. Uh, in two different uh, images, but this is woodcut. Uh, and then we have the, the watercolor that's, um, as you could probably recognize, is a kind of a double motive. It's both the pietas motive where uh, 
the mother of God is uh, taking Christ down from the cross after his uh, uh, crucifixion, but it's also her sitting with the baby, uh, baby Christ. Um, and then we have, uh, so this is not a face palm as it would be called in, in modern uh, emoji language, but it is, uh, so he, he, he uses this uh, image of Peter who uh, covers his head with his hand when he uh, realizes that he has uh, betrayed his best friend. Uh, so this is, uh, this is uh, for the hymn on Peter. And then uh, finally, this is, um, this is uh, the uh, charcoal uh, for the hymn on, uh, on, um, on Joseph. Uh, and this is the cistern that he's uh, thrown into uh, 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 when his uh, brothers uh, betray him also. So uh, I think this is what I wanted to present and, and talk about today. And uh, if anyone is interested, I, I brought some, uh, some books uh, that I can sell for a, a reasonable price. <laughs> <laughs> Questions from the audience? If there are, we have someone. Yes, go ahead. Oh. <laughs> 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 okay. So we live upstairs, and we had the honor to have the view from the church next to our bedroom to Christmas. And there's so many hymns and chanting, like for hours and hours and hours. It was really beautiful, creepy really early, though, but it was really <laughs> nice around to wake up. Yeah. But we were just wondering, it's just crazy how long they can sing. Is that some of the songs or hymns that you have been translated, maybe like the Christmas one you mentioned? It's like, how long do they do it? Yeah, so it depends a bit on uh, if you're uh, if you're at um, uh, a monastery, they would they could go on for a very very like eight hours uh, of constantly singing. Uh, in in um, parishes like uh, Ekaterini here, it's more like um, some of the really you know devoted they would stay there for a long time. But many people, that's what you would. Coming from a more Protestant Danish background, we are very accustomed to services are quite short and and you are quiet when you sit there. And uh, but here in Greece and in Orthodox countries, it's more normal that people go in and out, or uh, and there would be some noise also. Uh, and and what is most striking is that it's professional singers who are in in, in charge of uh, of, of singing. Um, uh, and um, and it's true that and and the, the, one of the reasons, perhaps or most likely, that um, that um, the contagia were shortened to a, a, just a, a minor part of what they originally were was because there was during the seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth centuries uh, a new form of poetry that became very popular, which is called uh, the canon uh, poems. And these are very, very long hymns. Like it's uh, a canon is normally like if we uh, if we take eight songs of four to eight stanzas and put them together, this is a canon, and it's it's sung often during the morning services. Um, so uh, so it yeah, and this is probably the reason why like uh, also the songs that we can see in the musical manuscripts that. They, they begin, actually I have an example here from, from one of the hymns. Uh, this, is, um, this is from a manuscript from 1270. It's the oldest melody to uh, the hymn on the victory of the cross. And I don't know if you can read uh, uh, score music, but, uh, or Greek even, or even medieval Byzantine notation, but it's fairly simple. So it has one note per syllable. Uketi floyini romfea filati tin pilinti sedem. For instance, when we uh, um, so there's a manuscript that's uh, not that much older, like 19 years older from 1289, and it's written in a much more uh, what is called a melismatic version. So it has, a, for instance, uh, I can't remember if it's an. Uh, on one of the syllables that is stressed, it suddenly has like 20 notes. 
So, u keti flo yini rom fea fila. And it goes on for on and on. So it's it, so this one would take it takes one and a half minutes to sing this hymn. If you sing the the the, the one from the manuscript a, a bit later, it would take uh, seven minutes. And if we have this hymn, like the uh, no the the hymn on Joseph, Joseph, that's the longest with forty forty stanzas. Uh, if you would sing them, and each stanza would take seven minutes. Then I tried to sort of it. It would take five hours to sing, sing this hymn, and it doesn't make sense that it, you would sing such a long hymn because the, the thing is also the more you stretch with more notes, the, the less intelligible it, it gets. You can't really understand what they're singing anymore. Um, so, um, but these hymns. Uh, so there is a tendency that when you short when you shorten the hymns to these only few stanzas, you can you can put in a lot of more notes, and then they become pieces that are much more um, sort of um, virtuoso, uh, where, the, where the, the soloist chanter is able to show his, his virtuosity. Um, so, um, yeah, so it's, it's a difficult question, but it, it must be because the services simply got very, very long, and then they were cut down, and then some places they're still very, very long compared with what we are accustomed to in Western Europe. Yeah, yeah.